My name is Dylan Beck. I'm on one of the on-site liaisons for this uh, Future Flux conference, and I'm here to introduce the Object Permanence Panel. So our moderator is Brian Gillis. He's a cross-disciplinary artist whose work examines socio-cultural issues from a variety of entry points. Gillis is an intellectual force in the field who is continually pushing critical discourse through innovative exhibitions, public discussions, and symposia. Brian is the ceramics coordinator and associate professor of art at the University of Oregon. Our panelists, Anya Kivarkis, Ian McDonald, and Javincia de la Paz, are all core faculty representing the craft areas at the University of Oregon, also known as the U of L. Anya Kivarkis, jewelry and metalsmithing coordinator and associate professor at the U of O, through the medium of fashion and red carpet photography, Kavarkas creates jewelry that deconstructs and reimagines re contemporary and historical trends. Kavarkas exhibits and lectures widely and has been the recipient of numerous fellowships and awards, and her work is included in notable and pr um, private and public collections. Ian McDonald is currently an adjunct instructor at the U of O, Though this fall he will embark on a new endeavor as the artist in residence and department head of ceramics at Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan. McDonald's work focuses primarily on the vessel, though whether he is making work for the wall, pedestal, or sculptural arrangements, the work has a high sense of design and references industrial forms. Ian's practice has taken him all over the world and his work has been published extensively. Vincio de la Paz is an artist and writer working with textile and fiber processes. His current work seeks out the material history of colors as a platform from which to view decoration, ornament, and form as inexorably linked to expansive histories of colonialism, globalism, and immigration. De la Paz has taught at schools of art and craft and design throughout the country and is currently fibers coordinator and Assistant Professor of Art at the U of O. Join me in welcoming Object Permanence. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's such a pleasure for me to sit up here with my colleagues and have the occasion to um, think together in a way that's directly related to our practices, which we so seldom get to do, but is something that we all kind of signed up for in thinking about being um, faculty in an art school. Um, in one form or another, many of the conversations I've had with these folks have been related to notions that, can, that are concerned with objects, objecthood, objectification, et cetera. All of us engage these ideas in our work and teaching in ways that are both specific and expanded. Uh, Jean Piaget, um, Swiss psychologist who first studied object permanence in infants, argued that object's permanence is one of an, an infant's most important accomplishments, says without this concept, objects would have, no, would have no separate permanent existence. I came to think about this through some things I'm gnawing on in my work that have gotten me to look for alternatives to the ways I typically engage and think about objects. So I've tried to process this idea in as many ways as possible. Um, as an educator, educator, I've been using object permanence as a theme in seminars and studio classes recently. I've been engaging colleagues and friends to think about it in a range of ways, including this panel uh, and a class that Jovencio and I will be teaching at the Oxbow School of Art um, in Michigan this summer. I've been thinking about ways to curate work from an for an exhibition that might be rooted uh, in a related premise. And I have some projects in the works that are, go that are gaining some momentum that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, but before um, telling you about some of these projects, I'd like to pass around a couple of objects that I think a lot about um, and are very precious to me. Um, so uh, Natalie, if you'll pass these around. Um, so the first object the one that's in a glass tube with some red vinyl on it is a piece of human copper light or fossilized dung that's 12,000 years old and was found in Oregon's Paisley Caves. Uh, this is a part of a larger sample given to me by archaeologist Dennis Jenkins 
after it was tested and shows DNA evidence of being produced by a human who had eaten camel, uh, horse, and also clay. Uh, the trove of samples pulled from this site in recent years have proven the existence of people in the Northwest as far back as 14,000 years, uh, which has uh, rejiggered the timeline uh, that's long been associated with the Bering Strait migration that we're all kind of familiar with that was previously 10,000 years. Um, the other piece is um, in, I guess, a dime bag which uh, <laughs> is uh, interesting to me, potentially. I didn't realize until I'm seeing it in somebody's hand. Um, this is a piece of Anasazi pottery um, in a dime bag um, from Chaco Canyon. Um, and this is a major center for culture for the ancient people of the American Southwest. Um, and this piece is between 900 and 1150 CE. So now I'm going to talk about these chairs. Um, I've been working with the Chipstone Foundation in Milwaukee to develop a project using a chair of theirs that was made for Thomas Jefferson by John Hemings, the brother of Sally Hemings, who Jefferson had an illegitimate family with. While the history of who made this chair is significant, it's also important to mention that it was actually copied from a chair given to Jefferson by an aristocrat in Louisiana, and that one was commissioned uh, to be a copy from a Spanish chair because she believed that it would somehow be a revolutionary cure for Jefferson's uh, debilitating arthritis. Uh, initially, I was, uh, I, I was interested in trying to think about ways I can flatten the mythological power of this chair um, or its, uh, its historical significance um, in order to get at uh, the impacts of discordant cultural context in, um, in domestic life more generally. Um, having recently been presented with the opportunity to use this throne made for Qing uh, ruler Hong Li, um, made at approximately the same time as the Jefferson chair during the end of the 18th century, beginning of the uh, 19th century, my thinking has shifted to consider the ways that these two objects can somehow be in dialogue and get at ways that social and cultural evolution is manifested in and complicated by objects. The, the Jefferson chair, seemingly a simple object by contrast, was the product of an extremely difficult process that involved, involved struggles with an almost non-existent infrastructure for communication at the time um, across any distance um, of note and limited access to appropriate building materials and technology. The resources garnered and the degree of communication necessary to make this chair is really remarkable and in many ways an interesting metaphor for what was a young, tenacious country preoccupied by liberation and social equity, uh, but doing so on the backs of people um, it stole from Africa. Uh, this, uh, Chonglong period, the, the Chonglong period from which the throne came out of not only paralleled the climax of, uh, climax of our nation's birth, but it also noted it also noted, is noted as a moment of increased freedoms for certain groups, such as the Tibetans at the time, and the loss of freedoms for others, such as the Vietnamese. And it is noted for having substantial pressures from the British uh, Empire, uh, which is often thought to be the final um, factor in the fall of the Qing, um, the, the Qing dynasty. Um, this is a study, I'm going to talk, just talk through a couple of pieces and then turn it over. Um, this is a study for a project that will, um, cite a, that will cite a blood donation center within an archive of objects and reference materials evidencing the history of human brutality as a way to ceremonially reclaim moments of brutality. Um, participants selected from the will participants select from the room's holdings, such as books, objects, videos, etc., and examine them while donating blood and mindfully repossessing, repossessing history uh, through the objects they engage. Um, but um, I'm going to be toggling, toggling through things. So um, I've recently established a relationship with the American Red Cross. Um, and I'm working with uh, some institutions to develop what I hope will be um, a project that travels between multiple locations and uses site-specific reference materials in order to focus social engagement. Um, so I've been talking with art centers and then also area archives to kind of use objects and books that are somehow specific to the site. 
Um, in this slide, the image below is a sketch for how it would exist in one of the spaces that's extremely large. Um, the one above is how uh, it shows how the, this is a modular system that could be reorganized to fit um, other spaces. Um, this image, these images are related to a project that's really in its nascent stage at this point, uh, where I'm trying to conflate evidence of the first people on the west coast who occupied caves in south central Oregon, the Paisley Caves, and uh, produced that um, piece of coprolite that's out here, um, with the story of Chaka, a mythological graffiti writer who bombed the whole west coast in the early 1990s. Uh, while Daniel Ramos was convicted and admitted to being Chaka, it's commonly thought to be physically impossible for one person to get up so much over such a long range in such a short time. Um, so at this point, um, the project is really just taking the form of what's essentially a fire, water, and crush-resistant box um, to contain um, the, some copper light. Um, but use kind of the myth of Shaka as a way to kind of guard it and amplify it. So um, working through these projects has left me thinking about a host of things related to objects such as social and cultural conditioning, association or perception, implicit biases, um, things like affordance, or the limits and potentials of form and material to afford certain interactions while restricting others. Uh, historicity, or the historical actuality of people and events, or the quality of being part of history as opposed to being uh, a historical myth, legend, or fiction. Um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the quasi-object, or something that's, that was proposed by philosopher Michael Saris, which is motivated by the attempt to bring new perspectives into sociological discussion of the role of material uh, and immaterial objects. Um, the adjacent possible is something I just recently came uh, across through a radio lab. Uh, and this is an idea conceived of by theoretical biologist Stuart Kaufman that proposes a kind of shadow future that hovers on the edges of the present state of things. A map of all the ways in which the present can be reinvented uh, which has been adopted by design thinking uh, relative to the ev evolution of objects. And I've been uh, rethinking value constructs uh, like use and exchange value, labor and sociocultural value, um, explicit and implicit value, assessed value, insurable value, market value, value going concern value, value objects, etc. And I really just kept returning to this question um, for, for which I'm engaging my colleagues to help me think through this. Um, how can I somehow use object permanence or the understanding that objects continue to exist when they or their conditions can't be observed? Um, since deciding to do this panel, we've really tried not to talk about object permanence very much um, so that we're fresh to the conversation. Um, and this has been uh, exciting and difficult because Hobintio and I are developing this course um, that really seems very far off in August but is just around the corner. Um, so to prepare for this panel, I tasked folks with uh, first considering ways that object permanence may relate to their practice. And really the majority of what we talked about is like this question or this very simple definition that came from Piaget. Then I tasked them to submit a reading or two to the group that somehow reflects some of their thinking. Um, we just had a Google um, file to do that. And then finally, once able to gnaw on things a bit, uh, folks were asked to give me questions that could somehow be used to seed discussion in this room. So um, finally, after decades in the making, we could have a conversation. Um, so I'm really excited to turn this over to the group and see how they're thinking. So I'm gonna turn this over to Hovincio. Okay. So I can get all serious here. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Brian. The paper that I'm going to deliver um, is short, but uh, I have gleaned a lot of these, sort of the, the structural logic that I'm going to be using um, to look at some case studies 
from Judith Roddenbeck's, I'm sorry, Judith Roddenbeck's uh, book, Radical Prototypes. Um, I won't sort of mention precisely where those structures appear, but if you're interested in pursuing that, um, definitely check that book out. Um, the particular notion of object permanence that resonates with me and my practice um, deals with the external sociocultural pressures that suppress or bring to the fore the complex histories embedded in everyday objects, materials, and processes. Uh, the very notion that some histories that govern the narrative of things um, can appear and disappear uh, interests me <coughs> as a craftsperson and artist uh, inter interested and invested in the ephemeral in particular. So in terms of choosing uh, some case studies, uh, I was thinking about something that you know, my field is textiles, and I'll talk about textiles in a moment, but we were at a uh, ceramics conference. I wanted to choose something that was sort of neutral ground as a first case study. Um, so water, for example, um, is an excellent case study of an everyday material and resource undergoing vast sociocultural pressures to control not only its distribution and accessibility, but also its cultural role and significance. Uh, by pressures, I'm referring to both active pressures say the Nestle Corporation's ongoing efforts to monopolize and control water distribution across the planet by buying water rights um, and resources, or on the other hand, the water fighters of the Lakota tribe and their efforts to fight the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, in the name of clean water for all. Both these groups actively um, alter the ideological landscape of how water is perceived, uh, and both groups' efforts uh, accrete around the history of water uh, influencing how future generations might relate to it. Passive pressures also influence our relationship to water. Thirst, or watering houseplants, um, or the need to wash the laundry, sometimes supersede our awareness of the active pressures around water, and we sometimes utilize it as a resource passively without particular awareness of the active pressures that surround it. In these instances, the fraught history and narratives around water recede in our minds. Uh, nearly every object we encounter in the physical world vacillates between these two pressures, active pressures, which are often sociopolitical, and passive pressures, which tend to be need-based, personal, and intimate. Um, history is not permanent in objects, but a fluctuating and vibratory component of things coming and going from vision in and out of our awareness. Uh, this is where I'll start talking about textiles. Um, from my own field of research, indigo dye uh, and the blue shade it imparts on cloth is another material undergoing curious pressures in contemporary cultural imagination. We know of indigo mostly through objects like this, denim blue jeans, uh, which ranks amongst the most widely made and used <coughs> and also recognized fabrics uh, on the planet. Historically, indigo uh, has undergone a variety of active pressures throughout its history, from Dutch obsession with indigo dye that spurred the colonization of Indonesia, to indigo's role as a cash crop of the slave trade in the American South, um, to the indigo revolts of Bengal in, the, in 1859. Um, indigo dye is one of the most fraught and contested common materials we encounter daily. Uh, we can say indigo is going through new active pressures um, which are aimed to reimagine its role in culture. Um, there is no shortage of curtains and duvets, pillowcases and napkins, table runners, uh, rugs, gugas, and what have yous dyed in both natural and synthetic indigo. These items are part of the larger preoccupation with the handmade that has swept us all up in a frenzy of consumption and production, um, and these items are deeply romanticized. Language used by their sellers reference the authentic, and this is in quotes, um, the authentic spiritual experience of indigo will bring peace and calm into your home. Or uh, standing on the narrow piece of land that divides the organic cotton and indigo fields from their conventionally grown neighbors offered intensely palpable recognition of what's at stake. This cloth pays tribute to the stewardship of the Texan farmers and real laborers. American grown cotton shirts dyed in American indigo um, will help bring meaning to your wardrobe, whether formal or casual, and help you think of simpler times whenever the deep blue 
touches your body. This too is a body that has been touched by the blue of indigo. Uh, the Blue Lives Matter movement, which claimed indigo blue as the color of police officers, raises <coughs> interesting questions. How did police lives come to know the color blue? Why are police officer uniforms blue? Uh, in my research for teaching a, a course spe specific on indigo, I wrote this note to myself. Early American and French trappers wore blue so that they would be camouflaged against the horizon as they hunted in front of the big backdrop of the Great Plains. The Union Army wore blue for similar reasons, but they were hunting the gray lives of the Confederacy. Then the Civil War ended and the slaves were freed, and when the police force became standardized in the 1850s, surplus Union uniforms were given to the police so that, indigo, so that the indigo dye for which the backs of slaves were broken would be called back into service. Uh, having used indigo dye in much of my own work, um, I'm acutely aware of the histories that I do or do not perceive in my material choices. Um, in my lived experience, though, from day to day, I do not often think of the complex and fraught histories around something so seemingly common um, as the blue in so very much of our denim. Blue jeans and the indigo in them are like a memorial to the slave trade, to colonization, and to the many lives lost and scattered for its pleasing chroma. Um, but because of both active and passive pressures surrounding how we do or do not perceive those histories, indigo in our clothes becomes a memorial in plain sight. Um, as an artist who has spent much time researching this one very specific color and this one very specific material, I wonder how many other histories we do or do not see and what pressures active or passive allow that. I think about how that might inform our work and our lives differently if we worked to make those histories even slightly more permanent. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, looks like it's some things are being cut off the screen there. But uh, So what I'm gonna try to do uh, is I'm just gonna talk about 10 years and 10 minutes. Um, that's what I'm gonna try to, try to get to you with my work here. And I'm gonna talk mostly about my work uh, with you here and we'll see, we'll just get started with it right away. Um, uh, I'll start back here. This is kind of, a, was a turning point for me. This is probably 2008. And thinking about uh, object permanence and thinking about objects in general, um, I've always been very interested in um, what I would consider the non-hierarchical object. So in this case, uh, this was a solo exhibition where I decided to have all the objects in one place. So rather than having them spread about uh, on different pedestals or in different locations, the entire exhibition would happen on one platform. And that was the idea for me, was, was, was the first chance to start talking about that all the objects were of equal value. And I was sort of walking through the different stages of, uh, of production, in this case with a, with a stone or an object that was you know, a very rough hewn object all the way up to a more refined object that might be in a, in a glass case, like in a museum or something like that. So I spent a lot of time working with, with this sort of um, idea in mind, the non-hierarchical object, and thinking about the museum, thinking about the, the precious nature of objects, and always really working in ceramics. So um, I've been working uh, through ceramic um, issues for a long time. And I, I continued with this, with this particular um, way of thinking and also thinking about the, um, the, the supports themselves in terms of uh, the pedestal also being part of the object. Uh, so again, um, matching, matching uh, powder coating to ceramic. Uh, in, in that case, I was really wanting to, to highlight the, the nature of steel and highlight the nature of the ceramic. So one thing that I'm always considering and thinking a lot about in, in, in terms of the object is, um, is the thing itself. I, I often say that to myself uh, a lot in the studios and I'm very much after the thing. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll get maybe a little bit closer to what that means uh, going forward here. So uh, as I moved away from um, these sort of larger installations, uh, but still thinking about the idea that all the objects that I was using um, counted with, had equal value. In some cases, I was making these wall works that were actually hung on single um, coat hooks. 
and in, and in some cases, um, not necessarily these two, they're, they're kind of hovering in space, and so they're, they're, they're weighted. So in that case, I started thinking about not only do they, they matter conceptually, they matter practically. Um, if, if I'd removed one object, the entire arrangement will come crashing to the floor. And so it was, a, it was a matter of thinking about weight and balance um, also with the object and their physical properties, which is something um, I think we'll get to a little bit more in terms of um, you know, what they, um, some of these readings were talking about the soft sciences of, of sociology versus the hard sciences of the natural sciences. And I probably lean a little bit more towards the, the hard science of, of the natural, actual material itself. So I spent a lot of time working with this, um, with this idea in mind too, designing shelves that were specifically designed to fit sp specific objects, specific o and, and going back and forth. Sometimes the objects were built first, sometimes the supports were built first, but in this case, this acts as a single sculpture. This is not a, you know, there's not a, oh, I like the single one off there and, and, and take it off. This, this travels to exhibitions as a unit itself. And in some cases, I would even call them that, you know, a, arrangement unit one or something like that to make sure they're always being kept together. So this is a, another example of that sort of idea. As I moved on a little bit further, I'm, I'm starting to, in, in some cases now, it feels like I'm, I'm distilling everything down to single objects, which I'll get to a little bit in the next, uh, in the next uh, five years and five minutes section of this. Uh, but uh, this was the last, uh, an exhibition I had in Tokyo where I just started all these parts that I was making I started um, not wanting to assemble them into anything, uh, but rather was, was finding all the parts themselves to be uh, of equal value. And so f this was the first time that I was um, you know, exhibiting all these small parts together. And now what I've been doing uh, in my studio is there's many, many cast-offs of parts, um, and uh, I'm keeping all these parts and kind of creating my own archive of uh, discarded parts that uh, eventually I hope to kind of show as, as a large archive of all these uh, many, many parts. Most recently, I started making works um, that, again, were, were dealing with a, with a confined space, but I started thinking about the tray, the idea of, um, for some reason, the idea came to me about breakfast in bed. I love the idea of breakfast in bed, uh, because of uh, everything gets served to you on this tray, you know, and it's like a perfect meal, and it sits right on you, and I, I love everything being confined to that very small space. So I started thinking about objects um, in relation to that, with these sort of uh, steel trays that were contained with these, um, you know, uh, the titles of these are always also very descriptive. This is like double-walled bowl on L-shaped pedestal with tray. So um, very much about the object itself. I spent a lot of time now making, making um, projects in the studio that I just call studio objects. Um, I, I very much consider myself to be a studio practitioner, someone that, that finds his ideas in the studio. Um, you know, uh, the only way, um, it's sort of empirically, you know, it's an empirical based process. I have to see a result and then and kind of work through it. So I work through materials quite a bit. And getting back to this idea of, of, the, um, of the, the, the science of it, the natural science of it, one thing I really want, and recently I've really been working in this, in the high temperature cone 10 reduction range, um, because I want this, I want the object to be hard. Um, it's, it's what I keep thinking all the time. I, there's nothing more satisfying than knocking a, a really hard piece to me and saying, yep, that's hard as a rock. Um, so I, I, want, I want that surface to be hard, almost like it's been hewn um, from a solid material. And in some cases, these are all wheel thrown objects that are made from many parts and, and parts being removed and added back together. Uh, and, in, and, and one thing I had to do um, to, to get to this sort of idea of things being hard was I had to kind of teach myself to throw very heavy again. Um, and, and so things are very thick. These things weigh kind of a lot. Uh, because there was something about, even though that can't be experienced, because we're not actually reaching and picking these up, it has to do with my experience with the object and how it, how it feels in my hand and how, how heavy it feels um, and hard it feels when it comes out of the kiln. It's a very um, satisfying moment for me. These are just other examples of these, of these parts, uh, objects and vessels built from parts. And you can see here, I mean, I've started to now show the idea of, of how I work in process in the studio. So I may make many parts. And um, um, I keep saying that word over and over. So it, I have to come up with a new um, adjective for parts. But uh, I had an exhibition that I actually called Parts and Pottery at one point. And um, I feel like I could just now name every exhibition I have Parts and Pottery, Parts and Pottery 1, Parts and Pottery 2. I may do that. But um, because I'm still working through all these different um, 
manifestations of, of making a vessel and making an arrangement in these finite spaces. These are some of these other objects. And you can get a sense of how they're made. I mean, they're, they're all thrown, so no, nothing is cast. And that's another, another reason that I you know, to, to, could bring up is that, um, not that I'm, I'm against casting or anything, it's just that the, the direct experience of throwing for me is, is one, uh, one reason. But also, I, I can't get the same sort of variety out of, um, of casting as I can from throwing. So I just make many, many parts and build up this sort of vocabulary of forms and then while in the studio, um, find some of these uh, final forms that way. And these are more of these uh, arrangements from this uh, last exhibition I had in New York of uh, more tray objects. These were these, um, these tray arrangements. Powder coated steel and um, ceramic. And I've always been working on these particular shade vessels. I call them shade vessels. These are a little bit taller. These are up in the, the two foot range, I suppose. They're starting to push the scale a little bit. Always in that, that cone 10 range, very hard um, surfaces. Made in, in parts. And then finally, just this is last uh, piece here. This is, they're not very good images, but this is the, um, a couple of these new pieces that I just finished and um, they're at this exhibition downtown as part of White Box um, and they're, I'm now moving into what I'm calling the low works. So these are uh, very, very low. They're only about three, three, four inches off the surface of the table uh, with these um, powder coated inserts, um, powder coated steel inserts. And powder coating has been kind of interesting to me recently. Um, thinking about it, it's, it's so, so related to ceramic. I, I don't know why I never thought about it. I mean, you <laughs> spray a thing on there, you put it in a, it's a very low temperature process, but um, it's been very interesting to me. So that's my um, 10 years and 10 minutes. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I'm Anya Kvarkas. Thank you, Brian, for having us here for this conversation. And thanks for being here. I'm sorry we've saved the longest for last, so bear with me. Okay. So. I'm going to talk about the idea of, ooh, I feel loud, of object permanence through my own studio practice, which is rooted in jewelry objects. In my work, I've been looking to find a history or archive of jewelry, and in doing so, I've realized what an undocumented history the field has for many reasons. An obvious part is that the field lacks a robust catalog of critical historical writing because there simply aren't enough academic programs that are focused in articulating and disseminating this history, which I would say across all craft disciplines. And also I discovered that within the history of Baroque jewelry specifically, that fashion shifted so quickly the pieces were continually melted down and recycled for their jewels. Objects just didn't survive the era. Sketches, engravings, watercolors, and painting are much of what documented the history of the material culture um, of jewelry because of course photography didn't yet exist. Our collective understanding of these historical jewelry objects has been mediated by their interpretations and representations, and due to a loss of these physical objects, a comprehensive archive of the history of 17th century jewelry, among others, of course, is not really possible. I'm interested in the way that Hal Foster characterizes an archival impulse and contemporary practices, and how he talks about the work of artists that seek to make historical information, often lost or displaced, physically present, by elaborating on the found object, image, and text, and retrieving them in a gesture of alternative knowledge or counter memory. This idea centrally informs my work, and I consider how these representations have become surrogates of both distant and recent history. I want to make this lost historical information physically present. Ultimately, I'm really interested in developing a neo-archive of jewelry from various periods and appropriated source materials. I elaborate on these found images and reform them into speculative objects. In translating these sketches into objects, their reconstructions were fabricated and carved directly out of silver and then airbrushed with white auto paint. Their surfaces were made matte white, matte and paper white, with steel gray burnished marks to describe the drawn lines of their sources. In Marcus Gunter's sketch of 1711, when deciphering parts of the representations where the details are too small or unclear in the reproduction, I interrupted the form with a blank spot or shallow cube that obscured the implied contents beneath. The reproduced objects were liminal things, between drawing and objects, hyper-detailed and incomplete, simulations of the original pieces and the things themselves. 
thing itself, Ian. Um, <laughs> and I'm just scanning, you know, lots of different sort of parts of my practice. And this work really ends in 2011, so I'm kind of piecing um, some old work with kind of a new idea I'm thinking about. So I also began making copies of representations of jewelry in Baroque portrait paintings. Can you hear me? This feels so peculiar, yeah. Um, this is Clara Elewin by Dirk Dirks van Sandvoort. I look at the Baroque period because it is a historically prosperous time of imperialist expansion where a new upper middle class status was celebrated. The material culture of the moment reflects this in its excesses and exoticism. People couldn't invest in land, so they invested in objects such as ex exotic shells. I love the idea of taking the history of painting and looking at it as an archive of historical craft and material culture objects. While Baroque Vanitas paintings present a narrative document of luxury, it is speculated that they simultaneously seek to reveal the artifice of the idyllic lifestyle by revealing the deception of the constructed image. In Scopic Regimes of Modernity, Martin Jay writes that the Baroque period is one of the first times in history that painting is not simply a mimetic representation of the world, but also about visual experience and perception. Physically, Baroque paintings have a hyper-real quality, and from a distance, meticulous objects such as lace and jewelry are rendered in such a way that they have a tactile and material, illusionistic, and hyper-real presence. As the viewer approaches the painted image, there's a perceptual shift that dematerializes the resolution of these images and the detail dissolves into abstract and dense accumulations of paint. Jay cites the way that Jonathan Crary characterizes Baroque painting as having a quality of hyper-realness because they are not limited by the structure of the frame, but rather the edges of the images are randomly cropped, arbitrary, and open-ended, much like contemporary photography. Objects are articulated by light reflecting off of them with many areas of focused attention, assuming a viewer that is not clearly situated. He talks about Baroque painting as a reconfigura reconfiguration of vision, as being of the senses, as a corporal vision or embodied sight, which diverges from Cartesian per Renaissance perspectivalism, where the image is clearly framed, fixed, with a singular point of view that is static, disembodied, and closed from anything that might extend beyond it. <clears throat> Martin Jay suggests that Cartesian perspective is a reduction of optics and looking to mathematics, and that it discredits the psychology of looking and how it affects perception. He states that perspective is contingent rather than universal. In my own studio work, questions about perception, absence, presence, the unreliability of pure optic experience and representations of it are central. I'm interested in what gets lost in translation from an object represented in an image to a translation of the image back into an object and how it speculates about what gets lost through representation. In this next group of work, I source the jewelry from Baroque portrait paintings. I appropriate the neck pieces worn by the figures and the images and I lift the representations directly from their painted origins. I recreate these pieces as they are truncated, a direct translation of my fragmented view through their representation. This piece is from a Dirk Dirks van Sandwort painting of 1644. And when worn, the way these neck piece fragments are visually understood is open and contingent on the wearer's movement through space. There are moments when the wearer turns in space and the piece perceive, I'm sorry, piece perceptually appears right, and as the wearer rotates frontally, the wrongness of the object reveals itself because the wearer and the object have different visual points of reference. So I returned to that painting and recreated all of the jewelry from the image to situate it in the context of its source. This aluminum panel is fabricated to the scale of the original painting and the jewelry is constructed with built-in glare at its painted scale. I removed the portrait sitter from the image and I wanted for the blankness between the objects to suggest the sitter's body and wanted for this image object to exist between a deadness and a kind of haptic reality. So here I shift to the Academy Awards and I'm looking at contemporary representations of luxury and celebrity through the internet archive of paparazzi photographs recorded on the red carpet. So in a 2008 exhibition titled Vanishing Point with gallery Rob Kud Ice, I began recreating these jewelry objects. They were interesting to me as a different type of portrait than a historical Dutch Baroque portrait. And I was curious about the aura of the celebrity and how these objects might achieve an arbitrary significance through their connections to these famous figures. 
These images were sourced from the democratic and accessible archive of the internet, which I select because of its nature as an ever-changing mega archive that disseminates information in a way that causes a fractured sense of time and place and fragmented sense of knowing. In the space of this kind of media, we are in so many real and virtual places simultaneously that we're prevented from being absorbed in any of them. I'm interested in examining this disconnect from our presence in time and space that this media-based source causes. So in silver, I fabricate, carve, and replicate only what is observable of the jewelry worn in these source images as they are mediated through their representations. I build the qualities of the depicted objects, such as, as the obstruction and gesture of the wearer's body, the cropping of the frame, blurriness, accumulations of glare, and sequential and perspectival views into remade jewelry objects themselves. And of course, I have a whole body of work that kind of moves through those um, different ways of imaging or making objects from these images. This is Rebecca Miller brooch. And when I made this object, I recreated it and retained the way that it was cropped in the photograph. The top part of this piece is rendered, rendered in a slight perspective, and the bottom fragment is truncated. And at the crop, the object has a thick cross section. In Carrie Mulligan Red Carpet 2010, views one, two, and three, I recreate a series of earrings worn by Carrie Mulligan as she proceeds through space on the red carpet. This is the first view. And I want to capture a time sequence of her, so let me actually move one, two, three. So I want to capture a time sequence of her movement in these objects I fabricate, implying her presence but leaving her body absent. These become a frozen record of a fleeting moment and distantly embody this famous character's activity. I have made many serial works that consider how we increasingly understand objects or events through a stream of images. And in the work, I'm not interested in achieving straightforward replicas of these objects, but rather want the objects to address our inability to truly fulfill our desire in coveting luxury goods. In these objects, we fail to connect to the originals because they are direct replicas of their representations. We can wear recreated earrings, for example, but they have the gesture of the celebrities' bodies embedded within the object, so they hang askew or backwards. They become recoded versions of themselves and reflect my love love relationship with the commodity and the image. So all of this brings me to this image, which is a conflation of the celebrity portrait and a portrait of someone in a ruling class or in a position of power, although I not, might not want to accept that. Um, Jake Rom, which many of you have probably seen this article, but he's a writer based in New York, um, wrote an article that critically deconstructs this Time Magazine Person of the Year issue with Trump on the cover. He points out that the sole criterion for the magazine's Person of the Year is the person who had the greatest influence, for better or for worse, on the events of the year, and has historically included figures that we can assume Time Magazine does not endorse, such as Adolf Hitler and Stalin. Um, he speculates that this image is a nuanced field of subversive references that three aspects of this image visually articulate. He isolates the color, the pose, and the chair. So he first talks about the, oh, wait, back, go back. Um, he first talks about the color and suggests that the washed out color represents the recently discontinued Kodachrome film that was immensely popular between the late 30s and through the 70s, spanning from World War II, segregation, and into the Cold War era. He suggests that those subtextual associations align with Trump's regressive policies, attitudes, and nostalgias for America's greatness in a pre-globalized world. And he continues to talk about the pose and suggests that Trump's pose can be a subversive play on a traditional power portrait. Comparing it to the Lincoln Memorial where we look up to a towering presidential figure, um, whose power is amplified by our position of looking upward. He suggests that because we see Trump from behind and eye level, the power of the image is undermined. He suggests that Trump's turn toward the camera implies something conspiratorial, as if we are seeing behind the scenes, a behind the scenes glimpse of a celebrity who spends far too much time in front of the camera. And most importantly, he reveals that Trump is seated in a vintage King Louis XV chair that was designed in France in the mid 18th century. As material culture, he proposes that the chair suggests a cultural moment that parallels ours, but during the king of um, Louis XV, who according to historian Nor Norman Davies, paid more attention to hunting women and hu paid attention to hunting women and hunting stags than to governing the country, and whose reign was marked by a deliberate stagnation and perpetual financial crisis. And um, he asks if this sounds familiar, which of course. And he directs us to look at the top right corner where we can see a rip in the upholstery. Um, 
that suggests perhaps Trump's own cracking image. And then this blemish might cause us to notice the wearing of the wood, the thinning of his hair that he's attempting to conceal, the stain on the bottom left corner of the seat. And Ram proposes that this entire illusion of grandeur begins to collapse in this cover image. Just have a couple more images to speak about briefly. Um, so this image is of Melania Trump posing with a bowl of jewelry that she's eating like spaghetti on the cover of Mexico's Vanity Fair, where almost half of the population lives in poverty. And the magazine tweeted about the cover the day after Donald Trump ordered the border wall to be built and suggested Mexico would pay for the wall. Oh, whoops, yikes, got this paper hitting that. I'm going back, sorry. Um, many criticized the editorial timing of this article, but in response, Vanity Fair of Mexico suggested that it was not actually a flattering story, and perhaps this article and cover are indeed subversive. Ultimately, if Melania Trump would live in the White House, it would save enough resources to cover the cost of meal on, Meals on Wheels, which is uh, deeply troubling. And so here's my last image. So I've just been seeing these images in circulation and thinking about them related to Baroque portraiture, and I just can't help but compare Melania Trump's Twitter feed to the grotesque quality of Baroque still lives that are so ripe and saturated that they are on the brink of collapse. So, thank you. Thank you. So this was um, really wonderful. Um, you know, there's something, there's something so great about um, initiating a conversation that you're not having yet and all the ways that you develop lenses through which to kind of ask questions and kind of um, uh, like reassess the assumptions you have about things. And um, it's also really nice to see how you guys are thinking about this in your work. Um, we're going to just talk for maybe 10, 15 minutes here, and then um, we're going to invite you to engage us through the, the microphone. Um, how, how do you guys think historical, historic objects function uh, not just as honored participants or purveyors of culture, um, but also as foils, agitators, instigators, flatteners uh, that you find interesting? I think in, in some ways, a bunch of us kind of suggested that um, objects, um, in some cases, are actors um, in culture. Um, but what are some ways that you guys um, see that's interesting that we haven't brought up yet with regard to this? Can you, defi can you define what a historical object is? Uh, let's just say like an object that is from a historical context that no longer exists. So, you know, you know, maybe uh, we say that we're in this era that has a certain um, type of technology or social constructs that's very different maybe than the 18th century. Um, there's still um, culture that's very similar, you know, um, in a lot of ways. But um, I think there's a different engagement with objects. I'm so curious to turn that question back to you because I am thinking about the Chipstone Foundation where you're doing research and I feel like initially I thought the collection was um, maybe uninterestingly historical but I think that they actually look at these kind of deep and conflicted histories of these objects. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering in your research there maybe to kind of trigger yeah, yeah I feel like, you know. Um, you know, and the Chipstone Foundation is a really interesting um, kind of steward of uh, culture through objects. This is this um, place in Milwaukee there that a very well-endowed um, foundation in the, the suburbs of, a very affluent suburb of Milwaukee where there's two full-time curators and a director and their mission statement is to create new knowledge in American ceramics and um, American furniture. Uh, and so with uh, John Crown coming on maybe like 15, 20 years ago, it went from just kind of um, uh, dealing with a collection of objects that they're kind of adding to through auctions to kind of really interrogating the origin of these objects and the kind of um, social and cultural uh, complexities behind them. Um, and maybe some of this thinking came from there. 
Um, and I, I think uh, one of the things, one of the reasons why I passed around these two objects is that I think we all fall prey to kind of like the aura of an object that's taken from a historic context. So, um, you know, and it's like not too um, dissimilar from like the aura of like technology you don't understand or something like that. Um, I thought we had until 10.30. Um, anyways, um, so like the, the fact that you're touching this piece of coprolite from 13,000 years ago is what's significant, not that it's a piece of poop. Uh, the fact that you're touching this um, shard from the Anasazi is what's significant, not that it's a shard, because we all deal in shards constantly. Um, so I think where this question is coming from is kind of um, thinking through how these objects kind of purvey a historical context or culture that inevitably it fails to do. And in that failure, it kind of myth mythologizes it. And I'm uh, kind of suspicious of the way I mythologize these things. And I'm curious uh, more about like what you guys think um, a historical object's capacity to be an agitator or mm -hmm. somehow be um, a flattener um, is, instead of kind of um, just lionizing something. Well, well I, I think immediately of the same, we've, we've talked about it once before, but how you know objects, uh, ceramic objects can now be used to trace the shifting of the magnetic poles. Mm -hmm. um, so the object becomes, it, it, like I was mentioning, it becomes less about what that object is in terms of its um, status as a status symbol, and it's like, a material thing, mm -hmm. so it, it, it does sort of flatten out the nature of, of that uh, object being, you know, fantastic and in, in, in being very decorative or whatever mm. it may have been. But now it's really about its material properties and the fact that it's become like a, a scientific device. So in some ways, it's uh, that's one way I could think about flattening out mm -hmm. a particular. That's really it, it. Feels very kind of genuine, genuine and authentic in that way um, that we're maybe willing to do from a a position related to materiality that we're not with history. You know, like we all claim to know something about history that we don't, uh, whereas when you can reduce it to basic material. I think that's also, um, I, I like this notion of, or this question about um, ob like historical objects which do not exist anymore and sort of how we relate to them uh, culturally, but also how they relate to um, like sort of political positions um, so I think about uh, this question about with 3D printing um, and sort of the virtualization or the reduction of an object into data, this notion of you can have a, uh, an authentic facsimile of like the Venus of Willendorf because they've scanned it, mm -hmm. her surface and it, it now exists uh, potentially indefinitely. The object itself is somehow now can, like in relationship to a network of other objects that are um, uh, you know, printed on these on these devices. I, but I think about so, for example, the um, uh, the idols of the uh, of Babylon that were destroyed by the Taliban, and the efforts mm -hmm. to sort of recreate them digitally through you know compiling many photographs mm -hmm. and then creating this um, like the, the 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 destruction of the object represents, or the the loss of the object represents sort of a, a shift in the political reality. Mm -hmm. And then so to regenerate that object isn't. It's a, an a antithetical or a, a act of resistance, mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that those those um, possibilities are only um, available in in terms of our contemporary moment, which I think is a very fascinating way to relate to the permanence of historical objects. Yeah, it's interesting to think about how, um, like, we might lament the kind of um, removal of an object from its context, um, but because of that removal, it becomes fluid in ways that might um, create like a different value construct that make it even more uh, resonant and kind of meaningful to humanity in a way. You know, I, I think the kind of subtext behind a lot of my thinking is just the realization that, um, you know, if there's a squirrel in this room, it knows no difference between the chair and the piece of copper light and, and how kind of we imbue these things with kind of this, um, this false sense of, of knowing. And it's interesting to me to think of how that could be fluid and we just call it what it is and that it becomes kind of generative and functional 
and um, impacts uh, different ways. Yeah, I'm just I'm thinking about the ways in which things might be reconstructed. Obviously, that you might reconstruct something from a series of images from multiple points of view, but to mm, also like your scan, work. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously. <laughs> but I think about a scan. I mean, I think about the. Um, Assyrian historical objects that are, have been smashed by ISIS and um, have been interested in the idea of reconstructing those objects. Mm -hmm. And in some way, um, yeah, I don't know, there's something about that. I don't know. First of all, it's, yeah, it, it's a kind of complicated question. Um, yeah. But, it, it, you know, I think about, um, I can't remember her name, the artist who scans the, um, who allegedly broke into the museum and scanned the objects and then, um, right. I can't recall her name. Do you recall her name? Uh, scanned the objects and then reconstructed them digitally. And I feel like there's something about the rapid kind of digital reproduction of them, their shift in their material qualities and what the language of that is. Um, I don't know, I'm curious about these kinds of methodologies of reconstruction, obviously, mm -hmm. and what they articulate about um, your position on mm -hmm. the thing, right? You know, I, I don't want to um, get too um, personal, but it's interesting that you, um, you know, these are Assyrian objects. Mm -hmm. We call them Syrian objects. No, we call them Assyrian. Okay, yeah, but the, Assyrian. the world doesn't understand what that is. What and this is coming from a person who's Assyrian. Assyrian. Yeah. And I wonder, um, you know, I think a lot of folks come from, um, uh, you know, I'm Jewish, you're Assyrian for a very long time. People have been kind of dislocated from their kind of native, um, culture, mm -hmm. and I wonder how somebody who um, is kind of seeing this, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, there was a, a place at one point that was kind of codified by objects and culture, um, do you think that there's something that um, changes in you and seeing this through kind of the mediated world, or um, do, you, do you learn something about... Um, are you think, does it make you think differently about um, what it is to be dislocated? And well, I think, you know, we've been dislocated for thousands and thousands of years that we haven't really been in a single place since, you know, seven, 600, 700 BC, mm -hmm. or yeah, uh, not BC, AD, mm -hmm. <laughs> where are we? Um, you know, it's so interesting because I think about reconstructing those and it would be entirely out of valorization, mm -hmm. you know? So in, in some way I'm distant from that history too because I'm first generation and, um, you know, there hasn't been even a language to connect people that's like purely clear as a linguistic kind right. of language, you know? there's So I feel like there's a lot of like objects and language that are all kind of fragmented that hold a kind of culture of people together that live very diasporically. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that question interests me, but, you know, my response to that would be from, like, at, in this point right now, would be entirely to valorize them. So that's, yeah. like, a, you know. Yeah. It's interesting to think of um, how objects um, offer um, this kind of way to, to kind of rethink or problematize this location. You know, I, I think... Um, in the, in the 18th and 19th century, as Europeans kind of gathered and kind of stripped North Americans of their kind of uh, material culture and developed these kind of cabinets of wonder, um, these objects that, you know, in an animist um, culture had uh, life through use end up being in these like boxes. And then, um, once the North Americans were like stripped of their culture through boarding schools and this and that, they were kind of told that you should kind of go there to find your culture. And it's interesting to kind of think about how objects end up being the, this thing that people kind of think culture is manifested in, um, but maybe what it really is is like language and food, like, um, like real intimate, um, like real intimacy and exchange between people, um, which, you know, in the case of the loss of language of North Americans, just maybe isn't um, possible. Yeah. I mean, I'm interested in the internet, the archive of paparazzi images and to reconstruct objects from those images that they might be these serial views and I might understand something through multiple views of one thing moving in space. Um, and that by reconstructing them from an image and you sort of pull them into real space and put them back onto a body because these things are worn, 
um, they're often sort of backwards, and usually the titles of the works will relate to the celebrity that they're affiliated with. So Penelope Cruz, and you know, they're sort of like on a person suddenly from the image, they don't translate when they move into real space. Um, and so to me, it's like the sort of the desire to acquire something of that celebrity on your body, and then the failure to kind of achieve that thing. Mm -hmm. um, like when the questions become more complicated like mm -hmm. that, you know, it's sort of the, yeah, the, the reality of the object in space is actually what complicates it. So maybe there's an, an opportunity that kind of use, um, like through like intimacy with the real body affords you um, access to a culture that just seeing a facsimile of it, or when it's behind glass in, um, in an institution, it is essentially a facsimile of culture. You know, uh, the thing that I've um, kind of become increasingly uncomfortable um, just with myself is like, I, I find that I like, I like reduce, when, when thinking about value systems, or um, I kind of reduce things down to these oppositional binaries. You know, I, I think of them very kind of black and white. And I feel like a lot of our conversation um, was, you know, uh, I really loved what Hobinsia was talking about, like the active pressures and passive use, and it got me to think about, okay, well, what are passive pressures that are socio-cultural and active pressures that are maybe more superficially about use? And Ian was talking about um, like the, the development of like a support system that um, was, there was no hierarchy that's kind of, um, and, and it got me to think of the absence of the support um, system. Um, and, and it made me think about like uh, the possibility of this like fluid dynamic between these, um, I don't know what you call them, like oppositional um, things, where it's not um, A, B, A, B, A, B. And I'm curious, um, how, are, how do you guys, do you guys see any things that um, are like distinctly incapable of being that and maybe are simultaneously like in and of the other thing. You know, I think like the, the notion of the active pressure and the passive pressure need that opposition. The notion of the support and the object, I think, I don't think you want it to have that opposition, but I think it does, you know. Um, so are there like objects that you see that kind of embody like some sort of um, fluid relationship that doesn't allow for that capability? Um, I think that the, the way that Judith Roggenbeck might characterize what um, you're, you're saying is that the opposition exists in the user or in the viewer, mm -hmm. um, but it, within the object, it, it is constantly all the things that it is, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So that, um, uh, I don't know why the example of like a quilt from the G's Bend, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the G's Bend quilts, um, the, the, for a viewer, they exist as maybe, let's say, three things. One, as this, this incredible document of the American South. Um, maybe two, it is a beautiful, aesthetically pleasing object. And three, for warming a person, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the object itself doesn't have the agency to determine what, uh, what at any given moment, it's um, the way it is perceived, mm -hmm. right? So I, I don't think it's so much mm -hmm. about are there objects that are, that embody both, but at what moments does a user or a viewer mm -hmm. impress upon it, it the particular need? So it's sort of like, um, yeah, that th th it's contextual as yeah, well. Yeah, that's right? a yeah. really wonderful point. So um, maybe we can extend this to, to think, um, I totally hear what you're saying, and it's kind of akin to the squirrel you know, not seeing a difference between the chair or whatever, um, you know, because it is about like a um, perception or, or like an organism's um, predisposition or necessity to engage. Yeah. Sorry, there's yeah. people who have questions. I'd Should we change the question? Okay. Yeah, and there's a few people that have some questions. Okay, I was gonna do that in, yeah, please. <laughs> is it? Yeah. Sounds so good. it sounds, um, it's on, but it's very, it's yeah. not very loud. Yeah. Okay, so I'm Patty from Ventura, California. Um, I really appreciate Patty. you guys um, coming up with this panel and the discussion. Um, kind of, so kind of as a new artist, you know, I'm trying to understand what maybe my narrative is. And in your discussion, 
it sounds like it's the very fact that we are interrogating an object or whether or not it has permanence um, <clears throat> gives it its value. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like that's what this maybe yeah. struggle is in this discussion, kind of yeah. just what you just started. Yeah. Um, you're either mythologizing or lionizing something. It's that the very fact that we either try to decide, well, does this have any value? Yeah. And like, do we dismiss it and just continue on? Or do we stay a little bit longer and decide, is it just that need that we have as an artist or anyone that just wants to you know, question any type of context, is it just that interrogation itself that gives an object its permanence or value? or worth or mm -hmm. wherever we're going with that. You know, I think this is kind of um, really wonderful because um, I think it's not just the human, but it's the privilege that the human comes from to be able to do that. And I, and I think um, what I, you know, in thinking about this question, like um, I'm curious like what objects um, are so like undeniably, um, call for a certain attention from a human that kind of subverts whatever privilege we have. You know, like the value system that we're talking about with the, the shard or the piece of copper light or um, thinking about the sociocultural problems with indigo, I, I think you have to maybe come from some sort of um, social and cultural privilege to be able to kind of take the time to kind of give it that value. But I, I wonder if there are certain objects, you know, a lot of people don't care that Assyrian monuments, I mean, obviously, a lot of people don't care that Assyrian history, um, material culture is being lost. Um, and I think there's uh, maybe cultural constructs and privilege that allow humans to do that. I don't think that they don't care. I think they actually care a lot, but they care that they are being lost. That they, they, they care that, um, you're, 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 you're referring to like these, objects um, in a way that's sort of like the destruction doesn't have value? No, I, I think um, what I'm referring to is like there's people who are like starving in the world who don't care about, you know, they don't care about uh, the... I don't know that... <laughs> I think that's a very complicated statement. Yeah, well, to but know I what think, people yeah, do and not care I'm, about. no, no, I'm just saying, like, from a, a Maslow's hierarchy of needs thing, there's a certain privilege. Mm -hmm that if you're, um, if you're like in a concentration camp, the abstract notion that culture is gonna be um, uh, preserved is wonderful, but you have immediate concerns that don't, um, maybe I'm being too flippant about the don't <laughs> care, but um, like you have immediate concerns that dominate. And I think there, um, maybe there are things like that image that you showed of the, um, the person being beaten by the police, that's an image that no matter what your predicament is, it's arresting because we see a human, you know, we empathize in a different way. Um, and so I think I'm curious, like, what, um, what objects may, might do that too that um, don't rely on maybe a, a perspective. I don't think that objects do anything. I mean, they're inert, right? We, we are the ones, and I, right. I think that, I don't know where the question ends. Patty. <laughs> I think that you're absolutely right that it, it is our gaze which allows for a kind of evaluation, or valuation, right, as artists or as users, um, and that objects are largely inert. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Should we move on to the next question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. somehow or somebody That's, make it simple for me <laughs> well 
Well, that's, that's what I would say. I don't know if I can make anything simple, but, um, but the idea, that I would, I would build off of your comment too, that, that I think part of it is, um, we've been talking a lot about historical objects, but you can also make this, you know, um, germane to you working in your own studio on your own work and, and figuring out, for me, this is, wh this is where I would, you know, um, say that I'm coming from, mm -hmm. which is someone trying to identify um, what work that I'm making myself has meaning to me in that moment and that, that I want to carry forward. So, mm -hmm. you know, editing, right? Editing is a big thing. So, uh, and, and thinking about the, the idea of, of permanence of, of objects you may, you may get rid of yourself or thinking about objects uh, for, you know, for, for those who have been teaching or if you've ever been in a class, someone's first bowl they make, they walk around with this thing like it's, th it, it's this incredible thing. And, and, and my response is, Let's make some more of those, you know, you know, let's just don't worry about that one, you know, so I think there's something within the idea of, of maintaining a practice of your own um, that, that, that has um, a correlation to this discussion. Yeah, you know, I think for me, this isn't um, a discussion about um, teaching. I think this, um, this is for me esoteric and masturbatory and came from this um, this thing that, um, in a way, I don't care if you care. It's um, like I, I, for me, what this was was like the recognition that I, um, there's an opportunity for me to consider um, like new ways to think about objects relative to my work, and then to project to to process them publicly. Um, hopefully, it um, catalyzes. Um, like a larger conversation, and maybe that's what I care about, the, like um, the investment in the esoteric and like the kind of speculative propositional thing. Um, and I think the, the thing that um, I've kind of learned from, from developing this and from what we're doing up here is that uh, we don't really know anything. Um, the idea of object permanence is this theory that was applied to psychology you know, and maybe it's something that could be expanded and, and rethought about. Um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. I think another way from. you can care about it, or if, if you want to um, talk about how to care about object permanence, um, in, in terms of one's studio practice, I think it's a question of what of my work um, is or is not important, and how is that expressed um, through my choices in the studio. So in, in terms of thinking about um, what histories or what narratives uh, are seen or unseen in the choices I make, right? Those things are uh, available to you to emphasize or de-emphasize, right? And I think it, it, as a tool, thinking about how to reveal or conceal um, ideas and histories is really important um, as, as an artist. So I can sort of happily work with Indigo, um, or you could happily work with Celadon, or whatever material it is, and say it is just a beautiful blue, or it is a beautiful green, or you could emphasize some other facts about it, which are deeply socio-political. And I think that's what is important, why we should care, right? So Celadon has a really complex history, and, it is, uh, so, and so does Indigo. Um, and so the permanence of those histories is controlled in many ways by a relationship between you, the artist, making decisions, and a viewer who is going to read those decisions. That's how I think I care about it. You said it better than me. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a uh, couple thoughts about what we're talking about. Um, when you talk about object permanence, those, say for instance, the looting that happened in Baghdad with those objects uh, from the museum, those were taken for, they were stealing those for money to, to sell in the black market, whereas those objects that were destroyed, say in Mosul or um, the Syrian or the Taliban destroying the Buddhist uh, sculptures that they blasted those, where they're trying to, ISIS and Taliban are trying to erase uh, cultural remembrances and trying to recreate some sort of new way of looking at the world, erasing what was before them. So there's this genuine loss of uh, uh, object permanence that way, where it becomes uh, trying to erase what was there and create something that's a new idea of what, mm. of what they're trying to, whatever abstract idea they're trying to create with this new Islamic, so-called so Islamic state. The other thing I was thinking of about object permanence with the jewelry is that back in, I think it was like the late 19th century, it was when they, they were really uh, caught up with death, 
they would make these jewelry emblems where they would take lockets of a dead person and incorporate them in jewelry, and then they would carry them around close to their heart, which is something that kind of has this idea of memory and object that you would kind of, that idea of replacing some, the memory of somebody with something permanent that would be on your body. So those are just some things that I was thinking of when, mm -hmm. yeah, what you guys. Thank you. It's, it's really interesting to think about um, how you have to kind of deny object permanence to kind of, you know, like what you were talking about, the kind of destruction of material culture as a way to kind of reset a new culture. And it's interesting to think about um, how objects afford this kind of physical manifestation of something that can't be denied. And maybe that's where this um, kind of preoccupation with value um, comes from. And maybe it's like in keeping with the idea of the locket in a way, it kind of uh, you remain close to the kind of physical evidence of that uh, person. short statement um, because I know we're running out of time but in kind of discussion with what you said about why should I care um, as a I'm a sculpture artist and I use a lot of different um, cultural symbols social symbols in my work and I didn't care for a while how people were viewing those symbols and those objects and my work became really confusing and um, I had professors look at my work and say, this looks like car racing, or this looks, and I'm confused, and this looks like cartoon television, and I don't think this is what you're getting at. So I think that um, as an artist, especially when you're using um, a lot of symbolism or objects that people, no matter what, are going to draw some sort of um, conclusion about, you have to be really careful. Um, about that and use symbols and objects to get across your meaning and also understand that people can draw so many different meanings. So it's almost like when you make a piece of work, you could you know, take every symbol or object you use in it or every you know, cultural reference and write down how many different ways that you can think of that people will you know, draw conclusions about it because you'll think one thing and someone else might think something totally different. And it's kind of like, as an artist, you have to be prepared for your piece of work to go in a million different directions. And I know I walked in a little bit late, but I think that it's really interesting that you have to think about that. Um, but I didn't care for a while. My work didn't make sense. And now that I do care, I think it makes a little bit more sense to viewers and those who critique and view my work. It's interesting to think about how maybe this is about a vocabulary or an opportunity for a vocabulary to en enter um, things. I want to say that I'm not exactly sure. I understand um, object permanence, but um, it kept reminding me of, of Bill Brown's Bing Theory, um, if you've heard of it. Um, how he distinguishes objects from things. So, like, I myself also have difficulty with um, understanding objects, but I do make a lot of objects, and I realize that um, it do, you have to understand the meaning and how it goes back, you know, like what she said about how people relate to it, and that, you know, what we make are things as well, you know, mm -hmm. so anything that Bill Brown refers as things is that sort of taken away from its actual context. So, for example, once we put it on a pedestal, it's a thing, and you know, or if we hold a, a glass of water and it breaks, it becomes a thing. Mm -hmm. So the existence, maybe what this refers is that it, it disappears, and that you'd realize the material of it, you know, where the glass breaks, and um, you know, in a way, when it becomes a thing, which probably moves away from the object permanent. You know, you'd realize, you know, you see it, you hear it, you touch it, you smell it, you sense it in a way. Otherwise, you just see it as a glass, you know. So, peop so as her question that she thinks that, you know, why does it matter? Of course it matters because we're, com um, we're filled with things, you know, mm -hmm. in a consumer society. You buy things, you do things. Um, but, I mean, probably when we talk about objects, we think about it in such a historical context that we sort of lose the sense that, it's like everything around us, and that things perceive so strong meanings. For example, 
you know, if you have an iPhone, it probably will show some status of you. Or if you, you know, we desire things that um, reflect on us. So I think, you know, thing theory is about objects and relationships and things like that. Mm. Um, and but, and we also like give it a lot of attention, which makes the objects or comes alive. So I really thought that. Um, in a way, you really have to work yourself through to understand how objects or things matter into your art. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, like she said, it gets confusing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's things, you know, there's critiques people would say, well, you know, I take this object as something, but people don't perceive that way. Right. So I think we have to be very conscious of the things that we use and that their historical context are very important in mm -hmm. how people think. Well, thank you. Thank you. And you know, thank you so much for um, coming. And this has been um, a really productive thing for me to be able to organize just for me to kind of um, be able to focus and expand my thinking. And I think a big part of uh, where that comes from is um, not just assembling these people who I kind of value their thinking, but you know, doing this publicly in a way where there's like risk and something at stake and there's the opportunity for um, people to come cold and to uh, contribute. So thank you so much for uh, being involved.